Yeah, my name's uh, Joey Tangaloa Tawari. Uh, I'm from uh, Melbourne, currently in the uh, uh, Broadmeadows Detention Centre facing deportation. Yeah. So that's how I've pretty much done just a, a little over eight years, so, you know, roughly eight and a half. Uh, and then when I was about 17, I moved to the western suburbs, you know. And, uh, that's what brought me to... Um, that's what uh, got me sort of tied up with... Um, with the bike clubs, you know, you walk into a pub and you can own the joint, you know what I mean? Yeah. You go into an nightclub and everyone sort of goes, oh, look, there's the, there's the Rebels or there's the, you know, there's there's this club, there's that club. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm there for about 12 months, I think. Um, but every club I went to, I went from there, I went from the Rebels, I went to um, to the Banditos, and then from the Banditos, I went to the Hells Angels. But every club I, uh, I, I nommed in or prospected in, um, I started at the bottom and I worked my way to the top. I end up being the president of uh, those three clubs. All that talk to my gang pulled up when we pull up and they all did. Yo, it's your boy King Dave here and this is the Felon Show. Her ball is going well. I got my doko on today coming live from Broad Meadows Detention Centre. How about you introduce yourself, brother, and where you're from? Yeah, my name's uh, Joey Tangaloa Tawari. Uh, I'm from uh, Melbourne, currently in... Uh, uh, Broadmeadows Detention Centre facing deportation. Um, but uh, I've been in this country for most of my life. I come here when I was about three months old. Um, but today we're going to do a bit of a testimony and talk about my life. And uh, exactly thank right. you to everyone. And thank you to you, uh, David, for this opportunity. No, all gravy, brother, all gravy. Man, to God goes the glory. But I'm yes, here, so he's going to share his testimony, man. He's come a long way, man. So, um, okay, so he's a former bikey as well. He's been with a few clubs. He's been to the top of that heap. Um, yeah, how about you start us off, brother? So um, you came here three months old? Yeah, so basically I come here when I was uh, you know, a baby uh, uh, with my family, um, mum, dad, and uh, a few other siblings. Um, you know, my siblings and us, we, we all grew up in Ringwood. Um, you know, we come from a poor family, you know, both parents work. Both parents worked, worked hard for us to give us a good education. Um, you know, went to Ringwood High School, Ringwood Primary School, Ringwood High School. Um, you know, and, uh, and then when I was about 17, I moved to the Western Suburbs, you know, and but uh, but our, but our family was a, it was a very religious family. You know, mum and dad always praying. You know, the Pacific Islanders. Our parents they that's that's their thing. You know, yeah. so um, yeah, you know, and and, and I think uh, I thank God for that too. You know, my parents were always praying for us. So I think that's what has put me back on this road, on this path. Yeah, and I definitely so, must have uh, protected you along your journey, man. Amen. Yeah, hundred so, um, percent. So, I mean, uh, up to when you moved out to the western suburbs, um, what was sort of life for you like um, as a teenager in Ringwood, bro? Was this sort of, um, did you follow the religious path at all at that point? or? Uh, we tried to, but really, you know, we were sort of like, I feel like we were outcasts. You know, um, a lot of uh, church uh, youth groups that we went to we were sort of like outcasts. Me and my brothers, uh, I don't know, I just had that feeling like, we all had that feeling, the three of us. Um, we we just felt like we were outcasts from that uh, from the Tongan community, so we just sort of done our own thing, you know. Yep. And uh, yeah, and that's what led us like to 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 do our own thing. Pretty much led us to find our own path, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yep. Yeah. Um. So so what what why the move to the western suburbs? So I met I met a chick and I moved to the west. Um. Uh, to the western suburbs, and um, uh, I was with that girl for a while. And around uh, around '95, we had a little girl, and she passed away at birth. And that was a turning point for me, where I just thought, you know, um, far out, man. God can do this to me. You know, I blame God for that. You know, so I started. I was bouncing, and I started, um, and I also started drinking heaps too. So sometimes. Um, used to go somewhere and just, uh, you know, typical uh, Islander, get on the piss and just run amok, you know. If, something, if I cop the hiding, I cop the hiding, you know. Yeah. Um, and that became like a norm, you know. Um, at some point, so I think to myself, man, like, how did I survive so many things? But like you said, hey, by the love and grace of God, man, and our parents' prayers, you know, they don't fall on deaf ears. So, yeah, um, and that, yeah that kept me going too. So, um 
Uh, eventually, I moved on from uh, from that kill I was seeing. And, well, can uh, you paint a sort of a picture of what the western suburbs of Melbourne was like back then, brother? Well, uh, the whole bouncing scene was different, you know, uh, and the western suburbs uh, was a lot different to the east. Uh, you know, the eastern suburbs is just like all Aussies and that, you know, mm. uh, unless you go to Mitcham or Nunawading or Springvale and that, you know. Mm. But um, it's mainly Aussies. But when you go to the western suburbs, it's got every nationality. Um, and, I, and I bounced up until about the year 2001, maybe. Uh, that's what brought me to, um, that's what uh, got me sort of tied up with um, with the bike clubs, you know, being a bouncer too and playing rugby. I was playing rugby. Uh, in the late nineties, I was playing rugby to with uh, Wyndham Vale Tigers, and um, it was a rugby league club. And that's where I met uh, I met the, the, one of the boys, uh, Phil Phil uh, Tiara. He was uh, he was um, a member of the Rebels, you know. Yep. And um, and that's where my journey started. And that would have been around ninety nine, you know. Yep. So, so yeah, yeah. Sort of uh, started hanging around them because yeah, the, the bouncing scene and the bikey scene sort of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? In a way, like um, yeah, that's a know. lot of people's introduction into that world. Yeah, they get sucked in. You know, you think, oh, you know, you know, like, like I say to people, the thing is, we get sucked in by fast, uh, fast money, easy money. Yeah. Guys are driving around nice, nice cars, nice bikes. Um, they got uh, beautiful women, but you know what? That's all for show. That's all for this world. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's all for nothing, you know. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, so like, um, so you sort of got introduced into the into that whole world. Um, did that escalate like your use of like alcohol and um all your violence and things like that? Well, violence it escalated the violence, but the alcohol it calmed me down because I, you know, as a, as a, as a nom a nominee, you're not allowed to. Uh, you know, some club, clubs call it prospect, but as a nominee. I, I, I dropped my drinking. I pretty much gave up my drinking. I thought, you know what? I want to be on the ball here because I don't really know what I'm getting into. But I thought, uh, and I knew that I was quick to get violent. So I thought, you know what? I better be on the ball in this in this case. Yeah. Did it give you like a sense of belonging in a way as well? Like um, being with the club and I guess at the time? You know, well, at the time I thought it was a beautiful thing. I thought, grouse, look at this. This is crazy. You know, you go for rides, you walk into a pub and you can own the joint. You know what I mean? Yeah. You go into a nightclub and everyone sort of goes, oh, look, there's the, there's the Rebels or there's the, you know, there's there's this club, there's that club. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it sort of gives you a sense of power, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. but the wrong type of power anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So um, how yeah. long were you numbing there for, brother? Ooh, I numbed there for about 12 months, I think. Um, but every club I went to, I went from there. I went from the Rebels. I went to... Um, to the Banditos, and then from the Banditos, I went to the Hells Angels. But every club I uh, I, I nommed in or prospected in, um, I started at the bottom, and I worked my way to the top. I ended up being the president of uh, those three clubs. Yeah. Yep. So, so yeah, you made it to the top of those um those heaps. You know what I mean? So you know a lot about that sort of a life, and um. Because you know a lot of youngins nowadays, they always uh, want to patch and they want to gun for that top stop, top spot, but um, it's not all as um cracked up to be on. Uh. Nah, look, you know it's not what it's look. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of uh, members of uh, motorcycle clubs that work and who do obey the law. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. But um, I can tell you now, it's one of those things that uh, the lifespan in it isn't that long. I always tell people that there's two places you either end up. One is you're gonna end up in jail, or two, you're gonna end up dead. You know, and if you survive it, well, I can say that um, maybe uh, the good Lord up there is looking after you. You know. Yeah, so, exactly right, brother. Yeah, exactly right. So, I'm what sort of led you to um, leaving um, like those certain clubs, bro? So, like, what ended? Uh, made you leave the Rebels and then sort of move on and. And with the Rebels, like I say, um, I used to drive to work. I was working at Shep Pallets in Altona, um, Grief Parade. Um, I worked there for a few years. And every time me and my mate would drive past the Rebels Clubhouse, I always used to joke around. You know, this is around 98, man. I always used to joke around to my mate, I'm going to be the president there one day. And he used to laugh, you know, we always used to laugh and go, yeah, I'll, I'll walk in there and take over the joint. Don't worry about that, you know. <laughs> and, and, and funny enough, you know, a few years later, um, I walked in there, and then a few years down the track, I ended up taking over the joint, you know. But um, oh. then it led to a fallout, and around 2006, I had a disagreement with um, 
very disagreement with some of the the high ranking members um, from another state. So, you know, we had a disagreement, so uh, and we called. We, we thought better off just to walk away and, and leave it at that, in which we did. So we walk away in two thousand six, the end of two thousand six, um, and then um, we get approached by all the different clubs. Um, so you were quite well known in um, not only the Rebels, but you were quite known, well known in the whole bikey scene. Yeah, yeah, you know, people. Uh, it was a bit of a shock to people that um, you know these guys just walked away. Just pretty much told them, you know, bang it. Basically, yeah. told them to bang it. We walked away because you know, in them days too, uh, not too many people walked away from clubs, and um, you know, and got away with it. You know, yeah. but I just yeah. thought, you know what. I've always had that belief when you're in the right, mate, I'm prepared to go to, you know, at that time my mentality was I'll go to war with anyone, you know? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, that's saying yeah. a lot, isn't it? Um, you, you know, being a part of three different clubs and making president like that really shows the respect that the whole that whole world really had for you guys. Um. Yeah, well, you know, like um, like I say, with the, with the respect part of things, you know, I always thought that violence was okay in that world, you know? Like it took mm. jail for me to realise, hang on a minute, it doesn't matter if it's violence in that world. It's still violence, you know. Violence really is not, is not accepted in any part of yeah. this world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, well, it's so, well, people feared you more than, you know what I mean? Like, uh, was it? Well, I think, look, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear, um, I think. But I think people loved me too. I know I like to think yeah. they did. Yeah. But, you know, like, like I said before to people, you know, if I've ever done anything wrong to people, mate, I hope they can forgive me, you know. You know, and I'm sorry for uh, if, if I've ever done anything that's that's hurt people, or you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I mean, so out of those three clubs, who did you stay with the longest? So like, how long were you with the Rebels and then the Bandits? Oh, with the Rebels, so around from '99 to 2006. Um, so that's seven years span yep. with the Rebels. Um, then I left the Rebels and went to the Bandits for two years. Um, and same again, same sort of thing. Fallout with them, and by that time. I left the, the Bandidos around 2008. I was over it. I said, you know, to certain people, I told them, mate, I'm not doing this again, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then come <laughs> come the Hells Angels. <laughs> around 2009, we started talking to the Hells Angels. Um, but we didn't prosper until about 2011, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And then, um, and then around 2012, I got my colours. And um, we opened up a chapter called Hells Angels West Side, a uh, chapter in St. Albans, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys um, started up that chapter. So were there a lot of Islander boys or um, what was, uh, there was, uh, the, uh, what was the racial? A couple, yeah, a couple of other Islander boys. Uh, uh, one of them, as you know, Letty. Yeah, yeah. But probably. Letty was a red devil on. at that time. Yeah, yeah, so he's been on. So, um, yeah, real good bloke as well. Completely done the 180, yeah. doing the riding now, kicking goals. So yeah. yeah, well, he he loved uh, he loved doing it with you, and he said he goes, man, what you do is a beautiful thing. So even myself, I'm privileged uh, that you've taken out your time, brother, to, to do this with me all day, brother, all Amen. day. Uh, okay, so yeah, so you guys started a chapter out. So like, what? So what sort of like the go there, man? Like of doing that, like, um, did you just sort of say, yeah, I'm going to start up this chapter, like sort of thing, or like, um, well, we sort of like uh, like let you touched on it. We came from. Uh, from Thomastown, we we're a branch of Thomastown Nomads, so we we're a branch of the Nomads chapter, and uh, and we went to uh, St Albans, um, but then uh, from there I end up going to jail uh, around the beginning of 2013. Yeah, and that's where I began my uh, eight and a half year sentence. Wow. Uh, so um, so was that sort of that time you went to prison? Was that the first time you had been inside, or I'd been in prison in 2009 for the same thing. Um, uh, it was a fallout with a member of, a, of another bike club. Um, uh, basically, I was going to kill this guy. Um, but, you know, thank God I never killed him. Um, but that was the plan. I was going to kill this guy for, for threats that had been made to, uh, to, to, to mates, uh, children, um, and things like that, you know. Um, but I look back at things and I think, you know what, threats, when people make threats, it's never going to happen. Um, but I always thought, I always thought, if I told you I'm coming to kill you, or I'm coming to do something. Um, I, I, I was, I stuck by my word. I'm coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then when, 
when that happened, um, this guy, in, he ended up going to the cops a couple of months later. Um, and then I got arrested in 2009 and I went to prison for a little bit there. Um, and then I was on bail for nearly five years. So before that sort of blew there, um, you had no um, sort of um, nah. been locked up or anything like that? Nah, clean, clean, clean record, clean, clean record. Clean record. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was on bail for um, for roughly like four and a half, five years. Yeah. Uh, and during that time, I had a few more children. I moved on in life. Um, and um, what happened then was uh, we go back to court and we're found guilty in 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we get sentenced, uh, me and a few coeys, we get sentenced to, um, to eight years with a five on the bottom. Um, and, uh, and that's where the journey begins with, um, with my uh, transition in finding God in, in prison, you know. Yeah, so, brother. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, so what, what happened uh, when you first sort of went to prison, bro? Like what was sort of your mentality? Like what prisons did you go to? Well, my mentality was I went to, uh, I went to MRC, you know. Uh, from MRC, I went to Fulham, to, to Marganate, um, Barwon, Loddon, Barwon. You know, just jumped around because uh, I went to prison at, at Hells Angel. And I thought, you know, you got to represent and do all that, you know. Um, but in the end, um, it was all not, you know, it wasn't worth it representing. Well, I saw things that I thought, you know, um, I thought to myself, wow, you know, it's, you know, guys guys were doing things and I'm thinking, you know, it's wrong. You know, like uh, on the outside, you know, if you're, if you're part of that life, you wouldn't be talking to that guy or, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then I seen all these things and I thought, what am I doing? You know, that was the first sort of sign to me, of what am I doing? And so you sort of started, that, um, you started seeing things that made you question that whole life. I like, do you mind sharing like what sort of things, bro? Like, is it like disloyalty, a lot of disloyalty there? Or yeah, like... definitely disloyal. I'm thinking, you know, like if you're a part of the club, you know, what are you doing talking to that guy from that other club? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then I thought to myself, guys have died. You know, like in that world, you think to yourself, guys have died for the patch, yeah. Yeah. But yet you're talking to an enemy. You know, that's how I thought. You know, I mean, I thought, nah, man, this is. Well, because that's know, how that, a lot that, of people view it, though. You know, I mean, a lot of these young guys, they think they view that. You know, that sort of lifetime uh, lifestyle. There's a lot of loyalty. Um, you know, when people die, um, they think that you know, there's like these grudges and things that never go away. And it is like that with certain people, but with a lot of people, it isn't, is it? Because nah, money, like, money gets involved as well. You know what I mean? Money, money gets involved. Of- yeah, money gets involved as well. People, uh, you know, like um, you know, you just sort of see things where people, you know, they put money first before yeah. loyalty. Um, yeah. So I started to question all that, too, and I thought, you know what? At the end of the day, one, one thing I re- did realize that. No one's got control of my life but myself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I need to take control of my life. Um, don't worry about what the next bloke is doing. Really, at the end of the day, if that's how he is, why should I let that affect me? Just don't worry about it. So that was sort of the start of, of, of looking at um, a, a questioning loyalty, you know, within yeah. the club, you know, especially being, being a part of other clubs. You know, I thought to myself, look, Really, they're all the same. There's not much loyalty. So, like, how long were you into when you sort of did find God? Or was that before yeah, so, or after? So, had you left the club like during that time, or had you, um, I, like, did you leave the club before that? Or I left the club before I found God. Uh, I, when I left the club, I left the club around the same time. So, when I chucked it in, uh, Letty, all the other boys chucked it in as well. Um, everyone goes, if you're going, we're going. Yeah. You no. Know, so I said, yeah, let's call it a day. But um, I'm over it, you know. Uh, and, and plus that time too, I think the club had only given me three hundred dollars. Um, mm. That was another thing, you know. Yeah. If you're supposed to be brothers for life, and you're giving me three hundred dollars, I've been in for a couple of years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know. So that that too, you know, that was another thing. Yeah. Um, but how, yeah, how but, were you after leaving the club, man? After you know having, like you said, come in, uh, come in an angel, you know what I mean, and all of that, and then you sort of just uh, left that behind. Like, um, how was that? Yeah, think, how, how was that feeling? 
Well, I think telling people was sort of hard, a little bit embarrassing too, you know, oh, wow. You know, and then all of a sudden you're known as the guy that's, you're almost known as the guy that's just sort of slattered himself out, being a one club, another, and then another. But like I say, I never fell out with these clubs because of my fault, any of my fault. It was mainly, you know, due to, um, it was probably on their behalf, you know what I mean? I just didn't agree. I didn't agree with things and um, and sort of, uh, yeah, just went from there, you know. And I wasn't about to bow down to anyone, you know what I mean? So yeah. so you ended up leaving, which, yeah, would have been tough for you. Um, but you found the strength, though, I guess. And um, so what, how did your time go after that, man? Um, were you sort of thinking like, oh, you know, you're going to keep doing crime maybe or like, um, but just not. Well, I was, club, but... I did. I did. When I, even when I left the club, I was still thinking about doing things and you know? I'm still going to do this or do that, you know, um, yeah. before I found God, you know, even though I'd left the club, but I, I, I still had my mind on, oh, you know, I can still catch up and do this and do that and you know? try and make some easy money. Um, and then it come 2016 when, um, when that, that priest, um, there was a, there was a reverend, uh, David uh, Holani, a Tongan one, he used to get around between Barwon and uh, and Marganite. But when I seen him in Marganite, I, I, I shrugged him off pretty much, you know, shut him down. Like, don't don't waste your time talking to me. Um, it's pretty much a waste of time, you know. Um, uh, you know, me, I'm not interested. I've heard it all before. I do outside, mate. I hurt people, you know. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't be bothered. So you didn't want but, to bother. Uh, yeah, didn't want to bar it at all, man. And and. You know, David, he was persistent, but um, but that's how it was, you know. And sometimes we used to run away from him. We used to come and call us out. We used to run away and hide. You know, tell, tell him, we're not here. But still persistent. But um, it wasn't until about 10 months later, I went to Barwon. I was tipped to the slot um, in Barwon. I yeah. get to Barwon. So the slot and, is uh, like man, uh, solitary, isn't it? So 22 hours yeah. down, high security, supermax. Yeah, and I, and I, and I get to him uh, to Barwon and... Um, you know, I asked for a Bible. They like, give me a Bible there. Yeah. Um, so in Barwon, uh, in Slot there, um, you know, I, I lost, uh, I left the club. Um, I lost friends, heaps of friends, you know, a handful of friends, even family members. You know, you, I wasn't hearing from family members, certain family members. But, um, you know, and I reached out to Tevita and I said, uh, Tevita, I don't know what's happening, man, in my life. But, you know, and I was pouring my eyes out. I was crying, pouring my heart out. Man, I, I actually felt sorry for him, you know, because he didn't realise. He, he 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 was like, well, all I can do is pray for you. But he, I could see in his eyes the pain. He could feel my pain, you know. Yeah. But that prayer, man, he, he prayed for me and that. And, you know, he said to me, he goes, you know, just be strong. You know, he goes, um, in Tongan, he said, I better talk a lot, you know, which means just be strong, man. You know, you'll be all right, you know. Yeah, right. um, yeah. But I, I, I believe for me pouring my heart out to him, it was almost like the Holy Spirit's cleansing me, you know? Yeah. Hey, it's time to let go of all this, let it all go. Yeah. You know, and, and like I said to him, Barwon Slot, I'd have Bible studies there in the slot. Um, me and this other fellow, he was doing uh, about 20-something years he got. Uh, it started off just me and him, and then we got to about five, and the, the five of us, um, and they had to shut it down. Um, so they shut it down, um, and I ended up getting moved out into the main out the back in... Um, uh, to Cassia. Yeah. So I started bringing the boys to the, the church there a little bit, but the boys weren't really into it, you know, but we started all going to church, yeah. uh, you know. So for me, it just, like I say, it was all part of that watering, uh, you know, watering my own, you know, my seed is getting watered. It's now into a little, uh, it's blossomed a little bit and just yeah. kept watering it. So I leave there and I get, they tip me from the main back into the slot. And that's where I met the Christian disciples. So around July, I think it was, 2017, I met the Christian Disciples Motorcycle Ministry, which is um, uh, Ross Galanis and, and, and um, it was George Leventis. These are the founding members of uh, the Christian Disciples Motorcycle Ministry. So I'm having a visit in the slot and these two guys are there and one of them's got the patch on. And you're not allowed to wear these patches in, in, into the prisons. But for some reason that day, look at how God works, you know. For some reason this day, I look over because I thought, at first I thought it was an OMCG. Then I look again, I go, no, nah, it's not an OMCG. It's a, it's a Christian CDMM, a you know, Christian uh, Motorcycle Ministry. 
Um, so I yell out to the boys, I go, hey, fellas, um, can you say a prayer for me? And they both turn around and go, yeah, man, for sure, you know? Uh, and then I, I think they said, one of them said, oh, do you want a Bible? I said, yeah, give me, send me in a Bible. And brother from there, and that was Ross, Ross said that to me. And I, yeah, so they said, no worries, we can pray for you. And that, and that was on their way out because they were coming in to visit other prisoners. Yeah. Um, then I get tipped from Bowen back to Marganite. I get moved back to Marganite. So I didn't hear from him until I bump into this guy named Gabby, um, a brother named Gabriel Worden. So I go to Gabby, you know, uh, I've changed my life. I found God. Um, we're talking, you know, I'm all about, you know, born again, brother. Um, it must have been a shock when you come back to Marganite. It was a shock to a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people were shocked. Yeah. And not only that, I'd gone back to Marganite probably, uh, when I went to Marganite, I was 120 kilos, you know, because, mm. you know, Bowman, the food's cut down, you mm. train, you yeah. know, in the slot, I was training in myself, you know. Yeah, blah, blah. So I, I, I go to uh, Marganite and I bump into Gabby and we start talking about God and I go, you're not going to, Gabby goes, oh, that's beautiful. He goes, oh, I'm a Christian too, you know. But I think uh, we don't know who the Christians are if we don't ask, you know what I mean? Yeah. So then I say to Gabby, I go, Gabby, I met these brothers, um, you know, they're from a motorcycle ministry, you know, um, they, they, uh, at, at, Bar, at Barwon um, and they were going to bring me a Bible and that. And then... But I've come here, so I'll probably never see them again. Mm. And uh, what happens? He ends up knowing them. They're his mates. What a small world. Look at how God put people together, you know. Yeah. So they're his mates. They come. They then come to visit Gabby at at uh, at, at, at Marganite, and that's how we reconnected. So they bring me in a Bible, and, and you know, uh, every few months they were visiting me there flat out, you know. Um, I had them on the phone. They were a massive part of my journey too, uh, the Christian Disciples Motorcycle Ministry, you know. So yeah. back in 2017, we move on to 2018. Uh, so I get back to Marganite at the end of 2017 and I keep saying to myself, you know what, there's no church service on Sunday. Why? Why? So come 2018, I organise a few of us there uh, and I say to the boys, you know, uh, let's get this church service going. So out of the blue, I just asked the officers, I go, listen, can you open up the, um, the chap on a Sunday? And they did it. You know, it's almost like um, divine intervention, you know what I mean? Like anything we ask for, they opened it up and they said, oh, does anyone know that you're here? We said, look, we've already spoke to the supervisor and that. They said, it's fine. But really, we didn't speak to anyone. We just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, bro. So <laughs> thank God, man, you know. And from there, there was myself. There was a couple of boys. I'll name a couple. There was um, there was a Tristan Dengler was there. Um, he knew a lot about the um, the scriptures. Um, Stephen Vasilevsky was another one. Um, Alex Sazdov, um, Imad Lakis. It was like, like I say, it started off. There was about five of us, and from there, um, we were using this the hymn. We were using as a hymn, um, "Nothing Else Matters" by Metallica. <laughs> yeah. you know? That's a good one. You know? And I told the boys, I go, fellas, I understand the song. It sounds like a, you know, a, a, a deep, rock dark song. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's rock and roll, heavy metal. So I go, but listen, at the end of the day, brother, I go, I go to the boys, it's about nothing else matters but God. That's how we're going to use it. Yeah. You know? Yep. So we're using just, you know, songs like that. Um, and we kept praying and praying. And our Bible study was growing. Mate, we were getting like maybe 15, 20 people in our Bible study. Um, there was another guy, Brad Palmer. He was there. Um, it was Bachu, the the um, the African came. There was Wag the Ayed. So a lot of boys come, but we kept praying. We need someone that can play uh, instrument. And you know what? Thank God, man, all of a sudden, three months into it, uh, Elijah Salisui, he turned up. Right? And I said he was God sent. And he knew all these different songs. And the guy can play. The guy's got that many talents, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and the church went from like 20 to 40 to 80 to 100 and consistently oh. sitting around the 100 mark. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we're rocking the joints. And, you know, with all the brothers, you know, all the all, all the tacos in there and um, all the Pacific Islander brothers, all the old sorts and that, there's heaps of us. Um, and, and our backgrounds, he, he, our parents, they pray for us all. 
Um, so we were rocking the joint in there with the scriptures and the word. Um, and it, we, we kept this going up until coronavirus, you know. And from there, like I say, I started to, uh, but even before that. So, so coming from Barwon um, at, around 2017, I realised, you know, what my calling is to turn my life, give my life to God, give my, put my life in Jesus Christ's hands, mimic Jesus, how Jesus lives. Um, and then just everything for me started changing, you know, even to the point where I was fighting for my two youngest children. Then when their mother had left, she got on the ice and that. Um, and I just thought to myself, look at all the things, you know. Um, so we have regret, yeah, but regret, you can regret things and go back to that old life, you know. But repentance is where you confess your sins and you move on and you hand your life, into, you, put your, you put your life in God's hands. And that's what I did, you know. So, wow, oh, man, that's <laughs> incredible, man. What a change, brother, in such a short amount of time as well. But, man, we find you know? God in those deep, dark places, eh? I mean, yeah, same with me, bro. You know, I, I found God when I was um, in high security as well at Port Phillip and Solitary. Um, those words speak to you, man, in those dark places. Um, don't get me wrong, it was a long journey, but, yeah, that's where it started, you know? So, um. Oh, so when were you released from prison, brother? Like, um, how was that? How so I got released. Feeling? So how was that feeling? Were you granted parole? And uh, so being a, a five hundred one uh, means that uh, so I'm, I'm a permanent resident, and they've they brought in those new laws around. They enforced them. For me, I got uh, my visa revoked in 2016, in January 2016, and um, I've got to fight now to stay here. So. Um, that, and, and what happened is I had three-year parole. I'd done my whole parole. And then I, I, I had these other charges, which um, I pled, uh, what was it, time served. So I pled guilty to and got time served. So that's how I pretty much done just a, a little over eight years. So, you know, roughly eight and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then from there, I ended up here, you know. Wow. So, But when I left prison, when I left there, man, um, like I say, oh, it's very uh, disheartening when you see the prison doesn't support these church services because I think church services are a massive thing. Oh, yeah, no, most definitely. The, the prison, they don't really support these things, you know. They yeah, think no, if, they if 100 guys are getting together, they're planning it. You know, they think if 10 guys are getting together, they're planning a riot, you know. That's right. Yeah, lock them up first, rehabilitation second, man. That's how they work. Yeah. Oh man! So, yeah, but, uh, so how long have you been hit? Uh, been in Broadmeadows detention for now, brother? So I've been here now for about three months. I think I'll come here in. Uh, what was it? The end of April? Or April? April? I come here. How's the, how yeah. about services in there, bro? Do they got sort of uh, church services in there? And we've asked. I've started a, a Bible study group. I've got a Bible study group that I jump in on. I've got one today at. Um, I'll just check. I've got one today at eleven o'clock. Yeah, so you keep so, them busy uh, there, aren't you? Doing uh, all these uh, church groups on Zoom as well. Uh, yeah, you're doing yeah. a lot. Eh? You've been doing a few interviews and things like that. Um, yeah, brother. You know, for me, I just got to like yourself. You know, like yeah, thank God, man. Uh, it's a beautiful thing what you do, and it's the same sort of thing. You know, like what you do for for brothers and, yeah, and for people out there. Um, I'm trying to do here for uh, for people as well. So, um, um, do you mind speaking on at all? What's it like in the detention centre there at the moment, bro? Look, you know, um, I, I think it's it's it, if anything, it's it's probably worse than prison. The only difference is you've got a mobile phone, which sort of like people go, you know what? I've got a phone. You can I can still see my loved ones. I can talk and not be limited. We can do this. Um, I can do zooms and all those sort of things. So. Oh, I think, um, yeah, it's, look, it's still in jail. Still in jail. Yeah. Yeah, by all accounts, man, that's all I've heard as well. I've spoken to boys at Christmas Island as well, and they're just saying, yeah, you get a phone, and that's about it, man. You know, I mean, everything yeah. else is just worse than worse than prison. Well, when I first came here, I, I asked about 10 times, probably more, you know, can you send me back to jail? I'd rather go back to jail. But, oh, uh, right. yeah, and they thought I was crazy. You know, but I look, I just believe too now that, you know, with myself, I think there's a reason why I'm here. Uh, and I use that, you know, like I say, if we can help people and thank God that, look, I'm still alive, that we can help people, uh, pray for people, uh, reach out to people. Every day I get calls 
from people, from guys that were in prison that have got issues, and, and I help them. I, I tell them, you know, look, let me pray for you and all those sort of things. Um, so I believe, yeah, I'm here for a reason. Um, we're going to start, we're trying to start a Sunday church service here with some of the boys. So, yeah, I just roll with what I say. I put my life in God's hands now uh, for, the, for the past how many years. So I just, I just let, I'll leave it in God's hands, you know. So, um, bro, do you got a sort of a message for, um, you know, because there are a lot of youth that are trying to get into gangs and, um, you know what I mean, trying to reach that top spot, which you've been to, you know what I mean? So what's your sort of message to them, bro, you know what I mean, about that whole life and uh, what comes with it? Well, funny thing, you, you, you know, uh, this question, last night I had one of the boys text me, probably about maybe 30 text messages about, you know, I, I need to make that money. I've got a family I need to feed and that. And I was just telling you, look, I love you, man. Jesus loves you. That's not the way. You know, um, what I, like I tell my kids, if you can't afford something, you have to sacrifice something to get that, you know. Yeah. Um, just work exactly. hard. Yeah, you know, and if you can't, still can't get it, you're not meant to have it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, you know, don't, don't get sucked in by fast money. Easy money, easy come, easy go. But when you're in prison, not only are you doing prison, your children do jail with you, um, your partner will do jail, your parents, your siblings, your whole family will do, they'll be doing jail with you. You know, the friends that love you, they'll be doing jail with you. So, um, you know, even in that respect, I had a mate, uh, uh, Brett Quick, mate, my mate Brett Quick, Skeddy, um, mate, my whole sentence, he was there. Um, uh, he, he covered me financially. My whole sentence, always. Anything I needed, bang, he was onto it. Kids needed something. You know, I was fortunate to have a brother like that. You know? Yep. No, that's right, man. I mean, yeah, bro, a couple of years ago, man, when I was sitting in prison, I never thought I'd be here sitting like this. You know what I mean? I was getting into the gang stuff as well, the prison gang stuff, and I thought that was for life. And now, yeah, man, I've moved right on. I couldn't be happier, bro. Couldn't be happier. Yeah, that's it. Amen, man. You know, like like myself, like you, you know, being part of these the, that world. You know, look at the time. Don't worry. At the time, that was oh yeah, no worries. But I look back and go, you know what? Uh, all right, I've, I've left that life behind, and now it's about saving souls. All uh, right, man. Well, so do you sort of have any closing messages, brother? While we uh, wrap this up. Well, like I say, brother, you know, uh, people don't, don't, you know, like I say, the fast money, the fast, don't get fooled. You know, the devil, you know, um, the, the devil tempts you in all these different ways, you know, and, um, you know, th 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 that's what the, the devil does. Okay, he was, the devil was sent to kill, steal and destroy people's lives. Um, I recommend that people watch um, John Ramirez, if you can. I recommend John Ramirez, yep. people to watch that past the John Ramirez. Uh, and he'll tell you a few things about life. Um, um, but like I say, uh, work hard, look after your family, pray. Uh, if you want things and you need things, pray. Ask God, you know, brother. All right, man. So I think we'll leave it there, my bro. Um, man, thank you for jumping on and sharing your testimony, man. That's awesome, bro. I'll leave your Facebook um, in the description as well. So if anyone wants to uh, get a hold of Joey here and uh, sort of have a yarn, but I hope all goes well with your case as well, man. And um, I pray that, you know, the, the Lord gives you guys strength over there in the detention centre. And, um, yeah, man, I hope you guys get out of there, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, before I go, I just want to send some love to all the top officers and, um, you know, all Pacific Islanders out there, you know, uh, in New Zealanders. Uh, keep the faith, man. Trust trust the Lord and, and keep praying, you know, as I will be. I've been praying for everyone. And God bless you, uh, David, I, I bet. Yeah, Obeda, brother. <laughs> yeah, Erks. Uh, Obeda, David Obeda. Hi. Erks was my old nickname in jail. Uh, God bless you, man, always. Thank um, you, I love brother. you and thank you for, for, for doing this. I love you too, my doko. All right, doko, much love, brother. Thank you very much, man.